hello everybody. I'd like you to welcome Alex Landau, and today he's going to be talking about building a culture of observability. Hi everyone, thank you very much for coming uh, to this talk. This talk is about some interesting work we've been doing at Rover around observability. My name is Alex Landau, and I've been at Rover for about two years on our site reliability engineering team. So I would just want to start with some quick facts about Rover before we begin. You can kind of think of Rover as like the Airbnb for pet sitting or Uber for dog walking. Basically, we connect pet service providers um, with the needs of owners. So we're the global leader in this space, uh, the biggest competitor. We just launched in Europe last year. And I think that we have a strong collaborative engineering culture that encourages experimentation and creative problem solving. And I think that that led to some of the work that we're gonna talk about today. I wanna start with uh, defining what we, uh, how we define observability at Rover, like how we think about it, and talk about why we thought it was important to focus on it, why we thought it was worth investing engineering resources towards it. Then I wanna talk about our particular approach to a few uh, major pillars of web apps um, and doing observability in web apps, in particular logging metrics and dashboards. And then at the end of the talk, I want to uh, kind of wrap up with like some higher level philosophy about how we actually built observability into our engineering culture. <clears throat> so this is a tweet, um, and it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek tweet from Cindy Sridharan, who wrote a book on observability in distributed systems. And it's basically like an overheard tweet where someone was saying that observability is just a new fancy word for monitoring to make it more palatable for developers. And I think that it's true that observability encompasses monitoring in a big way. But at Rover, we take the definition a little bit further. We think observability is all about knowing exactly what's going on in your web application. And when something does go wrong, knowing very quickly what went wrong and how to fix it. The metaphor that we like to use is telling the narrative of your application or the story of what's going on. And we think a culture of observability um, really empowers developers by removing uncertainty and speculation and making it uh, easy for developers to feel comfortable working at all levels of the application up and down the stack, especially as the application grows in scale and complexity. So complexity is something of an abstract term, and I want to make it more concrete with an example. And I want to take Rover's web app as an example of what I think is a fairly complex Python web app. Uh, we have about 600,000 lines of Python code in a single monolithic Django application backed by MySQL. We have about 100 developers committing code to that on any given day, and we're deploying changes between 15 and 30 times a day. We have thousands of individual views, celery tasks, management commands, cron jobs, basically lots of places where we execute code and lots of places where things can go wrong. We care about observability because observability has a real tangible impact on our business and on our engineering culture. It helps us wrangle the complexity of this web app. Um, some examples include bugs being much easier to identify and localize. When things go wrong in production, it's much easier to quickly detect what went wrong and then fix it. And then when we have like a root cause analysis after the fact or a post-mortem, uh, it's a lot more efficient and productive. That, that process gives us the action items we need to uh, prevent the issue from reoccurring in the future. Basically, observability gives us the detective tools that we need to eliminate mysteries and black boxes. We think these are bad things to have in an application. Um, and it's much, it, it becomes a lot more common to have these as your application grows in scale and your engineering team grows. And we think a culture of observability really helps us uh, eliminate those. So we've defined observability uh, as we see it at Rover and motivated our, our focus on it. Um, so the question then is, how do we actually enact observability into our engineering culture? And as I mentioned before, I want to go through three uh, pillars. So logging, metrics, and dashboards. And in each pillar, we're going to talk about a problem that we faced and a solution that we built in Python and Django. I'm going to focus mostly on tools for Python and Django because that's what we uh, that's what we use at Rover, but I think that there's some learnings that are widely applicable. And then at the end, we're going to talk about the philosophy that we use to unify these tools as part of our engineering culture. So we'll start with logging. <coughs> logging is fairly simple conceptually. It's just writing down things as they happen. 
it's a very you know standard way to um, you know keep track of what's going on in your application, but it starts to get more interesting at scale. So the standard best practice is to just log things to an output stream and then aggregate all your output streams in one single centralized place where the logs are structured and searchable. Um, Logly is a third-party service that does this. You can also use the Elk stack, which is Elasticsearch log stash Kibana. And the idea is you have a centralized stream that uh, developers can search, and they can search on different facets like application or whatever other things you think are important. And this is really useful for developers because uh, you can have logs coming from all over the place in your infrastructure. In fact, even on a single application server, you could have logs coming from Nginx if you're using that, your application, like your Python app, um, system processes, lots of different things that are emitting logs. Uh, this is a, an example of 10 minutes of logs from Rover's production application. This is from a Saturday last June, I think, for at about like nine, uh, I think it was noon. Um, and so we had about a million log events in that time, which is around 300 per second. And I think that this is like relatively moderate scale. I don't think this is, um, I think there are places that have much higher scale than this. Um, and it's certainly not our peak traffic during the week. Um, and so you can imagine these logs are coming from all over our infrastructure, from different applications. They're all centralized in a place. We use Logly, um, and it's a searchable, structured stream. But the problem is, at a certain scale, it becomes really difficult to focus on one particular workflow, so seeing the logs from one workflow. And when I say workflow, what I'm talking about is one execution of your web app, whether that's a request response cycle or an async workflow. There's a lot of components that are probably important to see in the logs of a workflow. Uh, request response metadata, like status code, anything that your application is logging. But then there's a lot of other parts that could be equally important, like if you're using Nginx and you want to see the proxy jumps, or if you're publishing async tasks from your requests, or in a service-oriented architecture if you're calling into your other services. Right? These are all things that you want to see as part of the components of a single like workflow, like request response cycle. But at scale, it becomes really difficult to find these in the logs. You can't rely on timestamps. First of all, timestamps are not always reliable in a distributed system. You can have clock drift. But even if they were reliable, a lot of things happen in the same instant. And trying to correlate all of the logs for a particular workflow becomes this needle in a haystack problem. So the common approach that a lot of uh, APM and tracing tools use is to inject a tracing ID into the logs. So this is basically a string that is unique per execution. Um, and it's generated by something. And it's injected into all of the logs. And the idea is if you search your logs for this particular ID, you get all of the logs for that workflow and only those logs, nothing else. Um, and the idea is if you can find one log, you can find all of them for a particular workflow. It looks something like this. Uh, this is just an example to illustrate what I'm talking about. I've highlighted the tracing ID here. Um, it's XYZ. Of course, in production, it would be like a UUID or something that's actually globally unique. And the idea is if I search for XYZ, I would see only these logs. So we have like uh, Nginx logs. We have some application logging, some Celery task logging. Um, and this is really useful because it allows you to just dig into a particular workflow. Well, we don't actually need any APM tooling to do this. Um, we can just do it with the Python standard library. Um, we'll use a logging filter and thread local storage. A uh, logging filter is a tool that the standard library provides to optionally filter out logs from reaching your handler or to alter log records as they come through before they reach the handler. And we're going to use the latter um, functionality. And then thread local storage is basically just like an attribute bag that you can use that is uh, safe to access within a thread and specific to a thread, which is important for web apps. So our production implementation looks almost identical to this. It's very similar. Um, this is the logging filter that we use. So uh, the, the tracing ID is being retrieved from thread local storage, and then it's being added into the log records dunderdict, uh, and that makes it accessible in the formatting string. So you just have to have tracing ID in the formatting string, and it will show up there. And uh, it's really simple to do this, and it, it creates a ton of value for when you're looking at logs. Now, the only complexity here is really managing the thread local storage, but you can, you can do that pretty easily in uh, a web app. It kind of depends on what you're using. We use Django, so we have a middleware that sets the tracing ID as request comes in and clears it as they come out. If you use Flask, you already have this with the request object that you can import. 
Um, but thread local storage works in, in all frameworks. So <coughs> one interesting extension to this is if your re web requests publish celery tasks, which is pretty common, um, it gets a little tricky to get this ID passed down into your celery workflows. Uh, we wrote a blog post about it. I don't have time to get into all the details now, but the basic idea is to put the tracing ID as part of your celery task IDs. Um, if you can find me after the talk, I can tell you all about how we did that. So once you've enabled this tracing behavior for your logging, um, it makes it very useful to understand at a granular level how your, your application is behaving like per execution. Um, but logging isn't great for looking at systemic or aggregate behavior. And you can kind of get some of it from structured logs, but logs tend to be really hard to monitor. You end up with a lot of false positives, trouble with parsing log formats that change. Um, there's a lot of issues with it. And another, another kind of thing that people don't really think about as much is logs are very expensive. And the cost model of logs sort of roughly scales linearly with your volume. As you get more requests, you're going to be storing more logs. And it's not great to rely on that just for, for monitoring. So to fix these issues, we have metrics. And metrics are also pretty simple conceptually. It's just a measurement of something that you care about. Where metrics get interesting is when you go past the basic metrics. Now, the basic metrics are basically these three. Um, these are the big three that most web apps are going to be uh, collecting. So you have error rate, how many 5xx responses are you sending back to your clients? Response time, how long does it take to actually respond to requests? And volume, do you have like a giant uh, you know, spike in volume or a drop in volume? If any of these metrics are going out of whack, then someone's getting paged, and your s people are seeing pages like the, this one from Reddit. At Rover, these metrics were not quite enough for to us to understand some of the problems that we were seeing at scale. In particular, we were having a lot of issues with uh, our interactions with our database, which is a shared resource. So it's very important that um, we utilize that in an in effective way. And this is kind of a common problem in frameworks like Django. Django uses an ORM, or an object relational mapper, which allows you to interact with Python code and have SQL queries issued on your behalf. It's basically an abstraction over SQL. And it's common in those frameworks to introduce suboptimal interactions with your database layer. So we were seeing a lot of this as we scaled. Um, it's a problem that's pretty pernicious because we have lots of places where we execute, uh, excuse me, execute queries, um, and we have a complex web app. So it was really important for us to understand how we were issuing queries. So we collected a class of metrics, uh, query metrics, and in particular, we we collect in production the a distribution of the number of queries issued and the total time spent querying the database per request for all of our views and per execution for all of our celery tasks. So this provides us a really useful granular view of how our application is behaving and performing with respect to our database all over the place. Um, we use StatsD to do this. StatsD is a common uh, metrics model in, in a lot of Python applications. Basically, you pre-aggregate metrics on all of the servers or containers in your infrastructure and periodically flush them to a backend, which is Datadog in this case. Um, in a moment, I'm going to show you how we use these metrics to power some dashboards and achieve some big performance wins. But first, I want to talk really quickly about the implementation, because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, the high-level idea is really simple. You just need to wrap your database queries, and you need to have like a hook where you issue queries. Um, in Django 111, we do this by extending the built-in MySQL uh, database engine and just overriding the execute method on the cursor. In Django 2, this gets a lot easier. It's supported as a first-party like API using the connection dot um, execute wrapper. Um, and the interesting part of this implementation is really around how we get the per request granularity or the per ta uh, per execution granularity. And the way that we do that is instead of emitting a metric after every query, we actually remember the total number of queries across the request and the total time spent querying the database across the, the request or task. And then at the end, we emit a single uh, histogram, which is Datadog's uh, version of a distribution, basically. Um, and that gives us the, the distribution of query count and query time per request. And we'll see an example of that on some graphs in just a second. I should also mention that we, we thought this was a pretty common use case to, to have this capability to do that level of granularity for metrics. So we wrote a library to make it helpful. Um, it's a library that's specific to Datadog, but it should be easy to extend um, for any 
protocol of Statsd that supports tagging your metrics. So we talked about this like particular set of metrics that have been really useful to us, so I want to talk now about how we put these into dashboards in a useful way. So our high-level uh, dashboarding strategy is we want to make dashboards very easy to visualize and look for like visual diffs or trends over time that make it clear what's going on for whomever is actually looking at the dashboard, even if they weren't involved in making it. Um, another philosophy that we have is we think that documentation should live as closely to the tool that's being documented as possible. So we actually put on our dashboards, like what are you looking at in each of these charts and what are the things you should be looking for in terms of what the lines are doing. So even developers who weren't involved in making the dashboards can get an understanding of what they're seeing. Uh, and lastly, when we're talking about dashboarding, we like to share examples or case studies of when the dashboards have been useful for us. And so that's what I want to do right now. I want to go through a few examples. And in each of these examples, we're going to look at what were we looking for on this particular graph, like what were we graphing and what were we looking for? Um, what did we see that made us take an action? What action did we take? And then what was the result? So this first graph is a graph of the median number of queries issued per request for a particular view. So this is that query count metric I was talking about. Um, so for each of these time slices, basically it's saying within that time, the median number of queries that any request to that view issued was this number, so about 200 in this case. Now, for this particular view, it wasn't really supposed to be doing much, and so what we were looking for is views where there's a very high number of queries per request or a variable number. That's usually indicative of the n plus one query problem, which is a common problem in ORM frameworks. The idea is you end up issuing n queries to fetch n rows instead of one query. Um, very common, easy to introduce in frameworks like Django. So we look for this on the graph. We see a view that is not supposed to be doing much that's issuing a lot of queries. And when we were able to find the n plus one query with our local debug toolbar um, and we eliminated it, you can see about a 75% drop in queries per request. So that was a big win for us. Another common problem in um, any framework that's usi using MySQL or anytime you're backed by a relational database is if you have a query that grows in time linear with the, the growth of a table, right? So that's bad. That's usually an indication that you're missing an index. So what this graph is showing is very similar to the last one, but this is the median amount of time spent querying the database per request for a particular view. So it's query time per request. And when we look at several months of data, if we see this trend of query time per request going up kind of at a linear rate, uh, that's an indication to us that there's like a missing index. Um, and in this case, there was. And when we added the index, we saw that the query time per request dropped very significantly. And most importantly, it's no longer trending up at the same rate. So um, this was really important for us. Uh, and then one last example. This is a little bit different from our previous metrics. Uh, when we, once we had a hook where we were emitting these, these query metrics, we started to think about what else might be useful around the context of a query to emit. And one of the metrics that we thought was useful was anytime there's one slow query, we emit a metric, uh, a counter, and basically some metadata about it. So what you're seeing on this, uh, on this slide is a graph of a total number of slow queries, basically. So queries over a threshold amount of seconds. I think it's two in this case. Um, and you can see that there were quite a few of them. And uh, it's broken down by all of the views in our infrastructure. So you can see that we have like kind of a, it's, I don't know how easy it is to see on this graph with the colors, but basically there were a handful of views that were issuing a large number of slow queries. And when we dug into it, we actually found that it was all coming from one slow query that was on a very hot code path. And when we eliminated it, we saw not only a huge uh, drop in the total number of slow queries, but we actually saw our database, master database CPU utilization and our IOPS dropped like very noticeably. So this one code change was really significant for us. <coughs> so I want to wrap it up with um, speaking, uh, taking a step back and talking about some um, higher level observability points. So there's this saying that goes something like, if you build it, they will come. And the idea is like, if you build tools that are useful, people are going to use them. And I think that that only captures half the battle. Uh, the other half is you have to document and evangelize those tools in some way. Uh, people aren't just going to use a tool that you 
that you build just because it's really cool and you know that it's really cool. So one example at Rover that we have is a venue for doing this where every two weeks we have an informal gathering of the, tech, the broader tech team where anyone can present on some tech that they're working on or some tools that they have. And that's been a really useful venue for us to evangelize these tools uh, internally. So as an SRE team, whenever we think that there is a metric that would be widely applicable to all of our developers, we, we actually go and we, we go out of our way to emit this metric in a way that we don't have to have our developers go instrument their code themselves. So we find a way, for example, with these query metrics where we don't have to have all of our developers go instrument their code in order to get um, you know, uh, the metrics emitted. And this is really important because it makes the observability culture frictionless and it makes developers much more likely to like, buy off on the tools that you're, that you're making, um, and it empowers all of your devel developers as well. Um, we also think that it's much better to have a metric and not need it than need one and, and not have it, because you can't retroactively measure something that you didn't realize was going to be useful. So we budget a lot for our custom metrics, and we err always on the side of granularity in terms of like, whether we think a metric is going to be useful for us. Um, and the last thing I want to say is you can, uh, you can think of SRE as this like reactive harm reduction um, you know, team where you go shake your fist at developers for introducing performance problems or um, you know, like, uh, you know, have these kind of confrontational or antagonistic uh, standoffs, which sometimes is what happens. Um, but I think it's much more productive to think of SRE as a developer tooling platform which means that you're building tools for developers. You're building tools to empower developers. The developers are like the customers of the things that we're building. We think that not only has this made our engineering culture like more friendly and inclusive, but it's also helped us scale the, the SRE tooling we have with a pretty large organization while having a, a fairly small SRE team. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. If anybody has any questions, there are microphones set up uh, in the back. If you go to those microphones uh, so that everybody can hear you, that would be great. Thank you for the presentation. It was wonderful. Uh, I'm curious if you have any advice for how to make sure that these tools that you create age well. Um, I found that when we create them, they're really useful for the team that we introduce them to and then the team changes or a new feature is added and it breaks and then they lose faith? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it actually boils down to a similar question about like APIs that you develop, right? Like how do you, when you develop an API, how do you know that uh, you're solving for the right problem, right? And that the API isn't going to um, solve for a problem that, uh, you know, or like you, you have a problem in the future and the API doesn't cover it. So I think treating the tools like, a, like an API platform, so when you're developing, trying to make things generic, as generic as possible. Uh, for us, queries is fairly generic for Django because we issue queries from many different contexts, but it all breaks down to interaction with the database. So we, we try to avoid building any tools that are only solving uh, one problem by spending a lot of time upfront thinking about how do we build the tool in a way that it might solve and other problems that are in a similar space in the future. Uh, like, it's a hard problem. There's no like, set answer to it, but um, so is building you know, a, a good API that, that ages well. So I think it's a very similar problem. So this, this might be out of scope for your talk, but um, in, in a lot of cases, a problem might be a result of an exception. And I'm wondering if um, you've found principles or cases where to ensure that when an exception occurs, you have enough context <coughs> available yeah, so one of the tools I didn't talk about that we use is Sentry. Um, and I think Sentry is a pretty, pretty widely used tool. So uh, it's not the, th these tools are not the only ones that we have. Um, Sentry covers the cases where you have an unhandled exception um, and will automatically kind of log a bunch of context for you. And then Sentry also includes the tracing ID. We make sure that all our Sentry contexts have that tracing ID. And we can use that to go into the logs and kind of dig deeper and see what was happening around that exception. Okay, thanks. Uh, you mentioned when collecting um, the metrics for like database queries uh, how, and how you would like send uh, basically state to Datadog, like a histogram to Datadog. How do you guys control like if something crashes or something like that and that state gets lost? How do you not interfere with the actual like 
query that's going to be run or anything like that? Like, how do you keep the tooling both out of the way but still useful, I guess? Uh, yeah, that's a great question because when we first rolled out the query metrics, of course, that's the code path that everything goes down, and we had an issue with it, and so, of course, you broke all queries, right? Like, um, in a certain sense, uh, it's unavoidable uh, if you introduce a change to a code path that is like the hottest code path in your entire application. Um, we try to avoid having things dangerous, we try to avoid doing dangerous things in that code path. So we keep it as simple as we can. Uh, we unit test extensively, um, and then we also do some integration testing. So we have like a staging environment where we're running um, Datadog and we can run some, some passes, uh, you know, making sure that that, that stats D path that we're impacting is not going to be destructive um, to, our, to our code base. But uh, the short answer really is that um, it does happen. Like there are times where we've introduced problems in that and it's a production outage. Um, and there's a trade-off of how deeply you extend the internals of something and how much you alter hot code paths um, and for the us, the trade-off was worth it. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Has your work uh, helped to debug uh, things that are problems with the ORM and work around those problems with the data view, uh, database views? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, one of the biggest ones was um, Django has this kind of issue when you do um, unions in, in SQL. Um, and uh, I don't remember the exact nature of the problem, but it's something like if you apply any modifiers to a query set after you do a union, they don't get uh, respected. Um, th this comes up when we, especially in the slow query uh, metrics, when we go dig into those slow queries and look at where they're being issued from and what the query actually is. Um, we, we log kind of the templated version of queries in that case. Um, and one of our engineers actually developed a library to fix that problem. So it's absolutely led to some uh, ORM improvements. Sweet. It's called Django Delayed Union, I think is the package name. Can, can you just uh, talk a little bit about how the workflows are actually created? Are they, are they spawned from your engineering teams? Are they spawned as a consequence of the application from your team? Um, how are, how uh, percentage wise, how is it divided up? Can you talk about how the, fr uh, the w different workflows are created. I think you mentioned they were workflows that each request. Yeah, th yeah. So um, I'm using workflow kind of as a model for any request that comes in or any asynchronous task that gets kicked off, and then everything that happens after that. So for to give an example, uh, we might have a request come in that kicks off a celery task, that kicks off three more, and so on and so forth. For me, that's th well, we consider it as one single workflow. So the moment that the code starts executing, to kind of like if you think of it as a tree, uh, the end of that tree. Um, so that's for us one workflow, and that should all be unified by a single ID. So even if that workflow goes on and on and on for a long time, um, we think that the tracing ID should be part of all of that. So requests coming in is one. Um, man Django management commands is another, so like a one-off command, and then cron jobs. Those are sort of the, the three where we start workflows from. Okay, yeah, I come from a uh, like highly variable, large enterprise environment where not all the workflows are auto-discovered, so I was interested to see if you had come across something like that. Yeah, um, one way you can deal with that, if you have that scenario, is if you have in your middleware like a header or something, um, this is how a lot of tracing tools do it, that's like shared, a shared library that all of your services use, something like that, um, you, can, you, know, you can accomplish the, the capability fairly easily that way. Thank you. So uh, as a pet-focused organization, was Datadog a thematic choice? No, it was... <laughs> Purely a wonderful coincidence that uh, we joined that way and that their logo also happens to be like a dog. Also, uh, serious question. Um, uh, do you have a, like a monolithic backend or some sort of shared library or, or how do you go about making these tools very available and consistent? Yeah, so uh, we have one large shared code base right now. Um, there are certainly advantages and disadvantages to that. Uh, you know, we can talk all day about the disadvantages. Uh, one advantage of it though is that um, you don't need to, like versioning is whatever is in the app, right? So when we roll out these tools, it's all in the same shared code base, so people can take advantage of them right away. Um, and of course, there are problems with that as well, but that's where we are right now. Thank you. Uh, so my question is about uh, asynchronous tasks, and I want to read your Celery blog post, but we have a JavaScript front end to then a Django back end, and it's gonna be fun to trace the requests from the client. Yep, uh, we, I, like I said, I, I'll, I'll be like outside or something and I can tell you all about how we did that. <laughs>
and we are at time, so I'm sorry, last question rejected, but uh, there'll be open spaces on this topic. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be like outside. Uh, you can so. find Alex outside. Thank you, everybody.